what were you doing? I was watching at this point. I was netting the shit out of him though, Luke. Like, you'd never seen a better net job. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Deep Drop. This is a fishing podcast. If you're new, welcome. I hope you enjoy banter that often leads to some pretty weird sort of conversations because that's what we're all about. But we talk about fishing. Fishing is what we love. Adam Ring is... Here with me, I'm Luke McCredden, and we've been a part of the fishing industry ads for, Jesus, it feels like a fair chunk of our lives now, and uh, and we still love it to this day, and we're still a part of the industry, and I think we're pretty lucky to be a part of this whole whole thing, mate. Super, super lucky, and our roles within the industry have changed a few times throughout our journey, which is exciting because it gives us experience from heaps of different branches to the fishing tree. So mm. that's been pretty cool. We decided to hit the record button and start a podcast where the questions are more important than the answers. Yes. Because if it's one thing you and I love, and listen, a little bit of a history lesson for those out there. When you and I first met, it was at Tackle World Cranbourne. We started I thought you were going to say love at first sight. No, okay. Well, it was a little bit like that, but... Um, <laughs> We, we were working together in the retail part of the industry. Yes. And one thing we found ourselves getting up to a lot is talking about the what-ifs. Mm. And I think it's important because we, we operate in a special space where there isn't a definite answer. Because as soon as you think you've got one, mm. someone else gives you a little bit of information that makes you think, hmm... I Makes may you. be barking up the wrong tree. So we thought, let's record those ideas, involve everyone in the fishing space, regardless of where you live and what type of fishing you do, and you give us more information Yeah. so yeah. that then we can maybe regurgitate it and form another layer of the conversation to then get you involved. This is a never-ending conversation podcast about everything fishing. Yeah. And I think it's pretty freaking cool. I love it. Did, so are you for those playing along at home, did you follow that? Cuz that was a bit of a that was a bit of whirlwind ads. I mean, that's one of the longest spiels about what the deep drops about you've ever gone with. And I don't mind it. Well, generally when I when you, <laughs> listen, we start every podcast by you asking all what the deep drop is and I generally yeah, because take because I can't answer and, it. Well, I generally take the piss and say something stupid. So I thought I'd take a different lane it. and try and try and make it serious. And yeah. guess what? I confused the fuck out of myself. <laughs> but it's okay. So I think it's the last time I try it. But you know what? Okay, listen to it. Now you can go back on you know on the Spotify app. You can skip back fifteen seconds or something. Just do it. <laughs> do it a few times. Get that. Get that fixed into your head. And then and now we can continue. <laughs> we can continue. Okay, let's we can start. Go. Let's start the show now. Yeah, it is crazy though to think. Oh, I don't even want to say it. <clears throat> a man of years ago when we were working in the shop together ads that we were having literally the conversations that we're having <clears throat> a man of years later <laughs> yeah. on a podcast, which is pretty... I don't even think podcasts were a thing when we were first having conversations about this. We, we were working in community radio. Correct. Yeah. There were literally there were literally tens of people listening to us at the time. And it was vastly different to what we're pumping out now, Luke. Ooh. It was we were trying to give you fishing reports on what was going to happen and where. We were talking oh, to yeah. plenty of different charter boat operators mm. and and recreational fishers throughout the area, our local area. It was a very localized show. And we'd every now and then we'd sort of zip up to cool parts of the state, like yep. Lakes Entrance and yeah. the rumor and all that sort of stuff. So that was that was pretty cool and that sort of started yep. the journey to where we are now. Yeah, because it was a sh- <laughs> It was a show based around reports and what's happening in the local area, which was, I think, fair to say, fairly, you know, serious or deadpan for well before we ever touched one of the microphones in that studio. And I, I think I might have, I may have derailed it, ads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, uh, I was officially not a part of the show when it was <laughs> driven into the side of a building <laughs> by one Luke McCredden. Yeah, thank you very but much. But let's just say, Luke, I, I'm not going to say it was a negative. <laughs> I'm going to say that you were well before your time. Radio mm. wasn't ready to have... For me. <laughs> have... <laughs> radio wasn't ready for Luke McCredden. Radio, radio, oh. Local radio wasn't ready for a, a serious chuckle. And I'll tell you what new- wasn't ready for me. 
was trying to do three AW a couple of times with yourself and Kramer and now that's a studio you can't have a chuckle in. <laughs> well, that you know that was a massive eye opener for me. I was I was invo- involved in that show for quite a few years and looking back on it, how we were able to time a conversation to the second to throw mm. away oh. to add breaks and bits and pieces was absolutely hard work. Do you reckon we potentially have tr- have trained or untrained ourselves like we could, we potentially couldn't get back into that format of radio now because it's so loose <laughs> well it yeah well it would it's funny you mention it because then after 3RW the exact format of mm. what the radio was we then transferred to community television with talking fishing mm. so that was that was even weird again because we're doing the same thing except you could see how awkward we were. Mm. So that was <laughs> yeah. interesting. And then and then as that finished, yeah. I kept going with Oh, you did. You did recent radio. With, of course. With radio, yeah. <laughs> which yeah. was done via it was then translated directly into a podcast doing exactly the same format again. So look, I just want to say, I don't miss mm. it. No, nah, fair is, call. Do you know this is, this is a lot more interesting to me? But it's also there is a lot more freedom. I'll go on record just straight off the bat. I fucking love radio, and I would dive back into live radio um, in the right forum uh, tomorrow if it was if the opportunity arose. Not, yeah, I'd probably I pick wouldn't. and choose what I was doing, but <laughs> I did. I, I I loved it. I love the. I kind of love the pressure of it. I, it's weird because podcasts and. Obviously, that's this podcast is what I've done, as in podcasting and producing podcasts for the last, you know, fair chunk of years, and I absolutely love this format, and this this is the medium that I love. But I, I there was always something about live radio that that I really loved. You, I peek behind the curtains. The the intensity and pressure on you, and you can explain it as well, especially a station like AW. And I did um a couple of stints on SEN on Rex's show as well when he was away. The when they need to throw to a ad break, commercial break, whatever you want to call it, they're like you're trying to talk about, oh, there's good flathead bite in, you know, Lake Ties at the moment. They're in your headphones, loud as fuck, going break in four seconds. And if you don't you don't wrap up what you're saying, they're gone. They're going to the Toyota commercial, or whatever it is that that's right, to be, they, because they've got some paying customers and they don't give a yep. shit what you're saying. And trying to talk about something, having someone smashing you through your headphones is so full on. But I kind of, I don't know, I kind of liked it. It was, it was weird. I wouldn't say I ever got used to it because the television no. was the same. Yeah. We, we had earpieces in and we could hear the producers counting us down which what had to go to an ad break. Yeah. And then we'd keep going and they're like, wrap it up. <laughs> You're going too long. Yeah. So and and I must admit that the TV was a little bit more forgiving, I get well, I kinda because the T V we did was live. It wasn't pre recorded. So yeah, yeah. it it went it went live to air as we were doing it. Though I felt a little bit more relaxed in the television format than I did in the yeah. radio format because mm. for some reason the the radio it it gives you a panic it gives you a stress yeah. and now and I'll yeah. be I, I didn't have to worry about any of it I was a co-host at best I was there for special comments and mm. to and to back up whether it was Dave or whether it was Paul whoever was who was hosting that series that night mm. I was backing them up so I didn't have to be I just had to be self aware that if we were getting close. I needed to keep my answers really short. Yeah, you were you were kind of uh, Brooke Lopez and Bobby Portis, just supporting us. Yeah, yeah. So, yep, supporting cast. I knew my role. Clearing the clearing the floor, spacing the yeah, floor. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Setting yep. screens. Knew, knew my role. I had, had a sweet pick and roll game. I'd box <laughs> out hard. Yeah, you would. Yeah, and you, I'd get yeah. out of the way. And I'd get out of the way in crunch time. So I yeah. knew my role. <laughs> Often you just drift into the corner, and hey, if the ball came out, you'd shoot a three. And I, I hey, and I think it's I think it's a skill, Luke, knowing your role and knowing when to get the hell yes. out of the way and shut the hell up. Stay in your is lane. Thing, because I've been a part of that many interviews, and I know you have too, where you've got producers in your ear telling you to wrap it up, 
mm. and the person you're interviewing or talking to at the time won't shut the fuck up. Yeah, that's tough. and 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 it didn't matter how regular they were. Some of them were really good. Some of them never got it. They just <laughs> didn't understand that this was a live program that had to run to the second. Yeah, yeah, and it was. Oh, we cut off a few people in our time. You had, but you had to, like, especially commercial radio. There was no, you know, there was just no room for just. Oh, we'll go another minute, see what happens. It was just like you can't, uh, you can't, well, because uh, it's worth a lot of money. Those sponsors need those ads, and 100%. it has. They have to get their time. You need to work around that. that and then for sure. there's. Then there's live reads. I'm not sure if you ever did live reads, which I'm all for. I can do them now if we had a if we had a sponsor um, and we've got space for sponsors. If you want to get on board, <clears throat> um, <laughs> if, I could do a live read. But I, and I've done a lot of, as you know, like voiceover and stuff like that. But I was doing a show with Rainer for on SEN once, and we're coming out of some pre-recorded ads into a live read. I, I had no, I was a fill in, like I had literally nothing to do with the show. And we're literally six, five, four, like counting down to do this live read, which Lee, it's his thing, just goes to me, you can do this. He just <laughs> swings back in his chair and I'm like, luckily, like it's on the screen. So I'm looking up there and I'm going, I've got no, I don't even know who it's for. I'm just reading for the very first time. This poor paying fucking customer has just got some absolute dead shit re- doing a live read for the company he knows nothing about. And I probably sounded rattled as fuck as well. <laughs> Well, it's 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 weird, yet you're right. The challenge being put on the spot like that. I, I remember... That was shit form. I, and I let him know about that for some time too. Thanks, Rainer. Oh, I, I remember <laughs> Dave going on holidays during the TV stint and he said, oh, you can host it. You'll be right. You know what yeah. to do. <laughs> yeah. So for the first time ever, I not only had to put the show together, which I never, ever had to do. Dave did all of that. Yeah. I, I, I literally, my role on that show was to turn up early go and have dinner, have a couple of drinks. I had to pre-organize a tackle segment. Wait, wait. And then, so I, would, you guys and then I would just sit down and write. drinking rock. before that. No, I'm joking. Dude, no, we were. And yeah. I'm sure some of the shows you could tell. Because for those <laughs> who haven't seen Talking Fishing, I worked with a couple of really loose co-hosts for mm. quite a long time. Yes. And and shout out to you, Trelly. You taught me how to keep a straight face yeah. on live television because... I won't go into too much detail, no. but the day that Trelly worked out that when I did my own piece to camera and he worked out that it was a headshot, this shit hit the fan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Yeah. But he taught me how to keep a straight face and no just doubt. keep the game face, keep the game face on. But hosting a show and trying to talk while yeah. reading a teleprompter, yeah, no. I found infinitely hard. I would yeah. have preferred to go in and just wing it. Mm. I tend not yeah. to feel as much pressure doing that. But again, trying to keep the structure of a show that was highly structured, I found I found uncomfortable and I mm. found it a little bit daunting and I'm sure it came across on camera. No, nah, mate, you killed it. I think it was great. And and the uh, just another one from that SEN show that I just thought of when you when we said getting put on the spot. The first time I did a fill in spot for Rex when he was he was going away, so I jumped in and did it with Lee. The first one. You know how I found out about it? Someone rang me and said, Oh, you're doing Rex's show next week. I said, What are you talking about? He said, Well, you just he just said on air that you're gonna be here next week doing the show with Lee. <laughs> and I listened back to the podcast. Yep. Sure enough. Tune in next week, ladies and gentlemen. Luke McCredden will be here with Lee, right? I'm like, so you oh, had no choice straight into the hot Cancel seat. your plans. You're doing the, yeah. you're doing the radio show. Like, yeah. I mean, that's, yeah. But no, nah, it's good. I think it's... Um, good times. It is. A lot of learnings out of all that stuff. But it's oh, funny yeah. because it's sort of come full circle to a point where we... And look, we've spoken about this at length, uh, even pre-starting the deep drop, is if we're going to do this, let's do it on our terms, which means we just have the freedom to do what we want. And, and look, hopefully that comes across for, for, for you guys listening. And, and I think a lot of what we hear um, ads is, is, you know, people enjoy the way we sort of go about it because we're just, we're not structured. We're not reading things because we have to. We're not holding out, biting our tongue. Um, we're just, you know, we're, we're, we're very much speaking the way you and I do and we say this a lot the way you and I do when we're on a fishing trip or a road trip or sitting around the fire talking shit that's what this is it's exactly it's exactly <laughs> what we want it to wanted it to be it's exactly what it is and yeah. I would find it hard going back 
to a fully structured thing commercial base yeah i think yep. yeah you get a little, little bit more of an insight into what we would talk about normally and mm. i think it's it makes it relatable yeah. i think it's uh it's interesting to listen to and I hope it's interesting to listen to because yeah. I'd, I'd like to keep doing this for a little while longer, Luke. We're having a good time. Well, I find the most interesting thing, with all due respect to you, Adam, uh, is the feedback we get, which we just love so much. And we talk about it throughout the week when we'll get a message come through and we'll, you know, like it's just great. So keep it coming. Um, we have a ball with you guys and hopefully you're enjoying your ride too. Now, um, ads, I, we actually haven't caught up at all this week um, we or haven't. even over the weekend. You've been away and I only just realized that you'd done you've been away fishing for a few days so and i literally usually we talk fairly frequently this is the first time i've seen you for the best part of a week so what have you been doing and where were you well we were at about this time every year we have a sales conference with rapala so for those that that don't know rapala is is a small group who basically get all of rapala done in australia i think there's one, two, there's about five or maybe six of them in the office now and then three full-time reps, myself in Vic. We've got one in New South Wales and one in Queensland. We get together about this time every year and we discuss what's going to happen going forward, what's coming out for the year, all the boring stuff, yada, yada, yada. What differed this time is Timmy, and shout out to you, booked us a house on the Clarence River. Oh, nice. So we fished every morning. So that's where you've from- been? Yep, I've been on the Clarence River for the last three days. And Magnificent. Yeah, we'd fish from essentially from seven till midday every day and then we'd come back and get a bit of work done and we'd rinse and repeat for the next couple of days. So it was a great trip. Learnt. Uh, this is why I love this stuff so much, right? So we essentially we spent three days fishing for brim and flathead and then we had a little bass fish on the last morning because sort of conditions presented themselves. Right. Got to fish with some incredible fishos who mm. have been doing it. It's an obsession for them and it's brilliant. You always learn off those people. Yeah. But what made this trip super interesting is for the three mornings that we fished, we had different conditions on each day mm. and the way it affected the fishing probably wasn't what you would think nor okay. what nor what i expected and so that was interesting in itself so we the first day we had warm no cloud bright sun dead set glass out no matter right. where you wanted to go you got there quickly you got there efficiently and it was awesome and the yeah. the fishing was fishing was good i'd say we got more flathead than we did brim mm-hmm. and it, the where we were the tide and the current was absolutely insane and i find it difficult going even back to any of the the stuff that i've done in western port and I'll be the first to admit it, the second the tide starts to run, I don't fucking know what to do. <laughs> and it shits me. Yeah. So it was it was really cool to see how they navigate the current. Yeah. That was really cool. Day two, it blew its ass off, Luke. Like I'm talking, it blew a solid and constant 15 to 20 knots and gusting to 30. It was yeah, right. putrid. Okay. Like, it was putrid. So, we had crazy tide. We had wind pushing us. We were drifting that fast at one point, working a rock wall, casting cranks for brim, that on one of the other boats, so our Queensland and New South Wales rep, they're more... One's a blue water specialist and one does a lot of live baiting and baiting for kings and bits and pieces in around Sydney. Yeah. They were trolling out the back. <laughs> we were drifting that quick and they were catching fish. Yeah, right. And then the third day, the wind backed off, but it pissed down rain for half of it. Okay. So three different days of fishing. The best day fishing was the day it blew 30 knots. Really? As far as yep. captures? Catch, right? Yep. And yeah. Yep. For both, wow. we, got, we got a lot more brim on the days that it blew hard, and then we found a bank that was just loaded with flatties. Wow. So the windier the day, the better the fishing. 
then the fine, calm, bright day was probably that. Well, that was definitely better than the third day. And the third day, once the rain had set in and that front had really hit, it was shit. Yeah, right. We caught a few fish, but we had to work bullshit hard for it, and so did the other boats. Okay. So, my question to you. If we relate that back to what we do down here, I'll use Western Port and Port Phillip Bay as an example. The days that it blows that hard and it's that rough, it's mm. not safe to go out. I'm not encouraging anybody mm. to no. go and do it. We we and the reason we only did it is because we're in an estuary space. It could it it could only get it was very shallow. It could only get so rough, and we yep. got fucking drowned yeah. on the way back and in because we yeah, had to but drive you, but you're not across, get... across the waves. The waves. It wasn't a port no of bay. Swell. Just turning no, over. Yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. no. Are we missing out on the best fishing on the windiest days? Um, I I mean I don't know because um, the the very windiest days. It's fair to say it's I don't shit to fish. <laughs> no, it's, it's shit to what, fishing. Just one sh- example that came sh- comes straight to mind as, as, as some of the land-based guys on the morning to Peninsula that chase snapper. The, the worst conditions is where they light their eyes light up and go, we're on. And you yep. go, fuck, who could be bothered? But the fish they catch are exceptional. And, yep. and, and you know, speaking to a few of those um, people that do that is, it's the fact is those fish don't come in that close and feed that way if the conditions aren't like that. It's just the way it is. So that's your option. And I'm like, what else? Well, to your point, what else? It's interesting you say that because on the day that it was blowing, all of our fish come insanely close to the bank. So we worked, mm. we worked a long series of rock walls casting crankbaits for brim. The closer you got it to the wall and the longer you kept it near the wall, the more fish you got. Yeah, okay. Then we went over to the other side where the banks were, it was a little bit more sloping. It didn't drop directly off the rocks. The closer you put, we well, casting plastics at that point, oh, and, yeah. and hard bodies, but if you were to put the lure or the plastic onto the mud and just bring it back into the water, we were catching flatties within a foot of bringing it off the bank. They were sitting in nothing. Yeah, and, and that's that's interesting in itself as to why they're doing that. Is it do they feel protected? Do they feel like there's less they're less vulnerable, or you know, they're a bit more hidden potentially? Um, but I was gonna, I just wanted to ask you about even just the way you work lures in that those conditions, because sometimes when it does, even when you're out there and it picks up, whether you're in an estuary or whatever, and all of a sudden you feel like you're so, you're so, um, well, I guess not in control of your lure action sometimes. Like, so what's the theory with some of the people you were fishing with and yourself in that situation? What, do you just do what you'd normally do and just trust that the lure is doing its thing? Well, this is this is the other bit of the weekend that was so ridiculously valuable to me. Mm. I've done a lot of brim fishing and honest... I can't catch the little silver fuckers on hard bodies. I can't. Mm. I've never been able to. And I think it's because I it's try a, and get... That's your Achilles heel. I try and get too cute with them. Mm. I'm trying to fucking twitch them and I'm trying to pause them <laughs> and do all this finesse shit. Just wind the bastards back in because the conditions were that bad. Mm. We couldn't do anything because the second you stopped, the belly in your line was so big you'd never see a bite anyway. And yeah. it would have been dragging your lure out of where it needed to be. And that's exactly why we were casting cranks on rock walls because the best way to work them is just to point your rod tip and wind. So that was that was really interesting. And also the current and the drift was so quick, there was no other way. You couldn't have fished those walls the way we were with soft plastics, you would have caught plenty of fish if the mm. tide was slower and the conditions were better, yeah. but you would have never seen a bite because the, the belly and the line was, line was so big, you would never have seen it. And even if it was calm, the drift is so quick because of the tide, you, couldn't, you wouldn't be able to stay connected to a plastic, yet if the, when the tide slowed, the fishing slowed. So it was... Yeah. 
it it's, was just a set of conditions that made me think, as someone who has struggled to catch fish on lures, mm. stop thinking and just wind them back in. Because mm. I don't even sl- I don't slow retrieve, constant retrieve anything. I catch ninety nine percent of my fish on soft plastics, so I'm always yep. twitching and bumping. I'm never just slow winding. Even if I'm using a paddle tail or something that is designed that can be just flat retrieved as well, I don't do it. And I think I'm leaving so many fish on the table because I'm trying to be too cute with it. And that was one of the biggest things I took away from Mm. that entire weekend is let the the conditions tell you how to fish and be confident fishing that way. But even just to accept the weather the way it is and go fishing regardless. And again, to your point, we're not condoning going out in 30 knot winds anywhere. But in an estuary, it's a little bit different. Like you sort of can. Um, yeah. But or, you know, wherever you are, check their local conditions. I'm not, I don't need to say that. But the, um, the fact that, like, would you have looked at that in a non... In, in, with, if you were just up there on your own and looked at those conditions, would you have fished? Well, not a fucking hope in hell. Yeah. But here's the, but here's the mindset. And Luke, we did an episode of this show a little while ago based around what makes the one percenters. What makes those those good fishermen to unbelievable fishermen. Now I'm mm. lucky enough that I have a couple of people that I work with that sit in our office that are those one percent fishermen. Yep. So sure. they were obviously checking conditions and checking forecasts as they always do. Mm. And in honesty, they probably wouldn't necessarily have fished if we weren't there as a crew. They wanted the, they wanted to show us their fishery. They wanted yep. to take us fishing. They wanted us getting and using some of the gear that we're selling. Yep. So not going wasn't an option. But it was interesting seeing their mindset. They checked mm. the wind, go, it's blowing its ass off, so we should go here, 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 and here. The, the mindset was, no matter what happens, we're going because mm. where we were fishing, even in those conditions, it was safe. We we're in boats that were designed to handle that sort yep. of condition. So yep. I obviously wouldn't have taken a kayak out there. That would have been ridiculous. No. Yeah. Uh, but we got wet. We got yep. very wet. Yeah. But... Yeah, you're the, not going to mind- be. You're not going to be super comfortable. You're going to get a bit wet. You know, you might be cold if the, you know whatever. But but they but they looked at it. They looked at the direction of the wind, the strength of the wind in comparison to the tide, and said, okay, the conditions are allow us to going to go and fish here, here, and here somewhat efficient uh, efficiently. It's going to be uncomfortable, but we're going to be able to do it. Whereas I would have seen fifteen to twenty knots and gone, fuck that, we're not going. Yeah. And that's and that's the difference. That's that's one of the things that makes up a one percenter, and is yeah. exactly why I'm not a one percenter. Yeah. <laughs> but it was yeah. fascinating. It was fascinating to see because never once did any of them whinge that we should just go back in because because the conditions were shit. We were catching fish, yeah. and they had a plan to use the conditions to give us the best possible chance. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's it's a really fascinating discussion because I think, you know, growing up or whatever, when you you know the, the best the best conditions are glassed out with a bit of sunshine. Oh, how good! What a what a beautiful day! And don't get me wrong, they are beautiful days, but they're more often than not far from the best conditions to actually go fishing. Yeah. Very far. Um, so we because we had a oddly enough had a similar conversation the other day. I was out on the water. Um, with our mate John Didge and we were talking and there was just a nice sort of breeze um, across the water that was just enough to unsettle the surface, which was good for what we were doing. We were fishing in very shallow water and, and so forth. So, you know, you can be forgiven for looking, even if there's a few white caps or, you know, whether it's on an est- on a river or whatever, you're just going, nah, it's, not, it's going to be too hard. It's, I won't even get a lure working right or whatever it is. But far out. I mean, the other thing to consider if you're near an estuary system is not always, but like there's often some really good land based opportunities in all different parts of a river, whether it's down the mouth or up the river somewhere. There might be some good um, openings to 
get amongst it. That that kind of lends itself to land based stuff because you're not needing to fish deep water or channels or you, like you're literally peppering the edges. Well, it was. It's interesting you bring that up because a lot a long time ago, um, with our good friend Mitchell Chapman, who knows how to catch a fish or two, we were yeah. at, we were at Lake Tyres on a trip, and again we had these filthy conditions. Not mm. not gnarly enough that it was going to ruin the effort to get there, but it was shit, and, yeah. and it was. We ended up finding a bank that the wind was pushing directly into. So, again, it was disturbing the water. Anything in it was pushing directly onto this little beach. Yeah. And Mitch hooked a fish right up tight on the beach, hooked a brim. And we thought, okay, that's cool, and then hooked another one. And then as we What, started, what were you doing? Yeah, I was watching at this point because <laughs> I'm... Oh, because you were using hard Moral bodies. support, moral support. <laughs> I, was, I was netting the shit out of them, though, Luke. Like, you'd <laughs> oh, never seen a better net job. Hey. This is this is the stay in your lane, know your role type. Thing. Exactly <laughs> right. So, so as as we thought, okay, we could be onto something. We started paying yeah. attention. We started seeing fish really shallow, right? But the conditions yeah. were shit. We couldn't stand properly, and it was crap. So we beached the boat, and we got off, and we walked the sand, and caught all of our fish walking, just like because it. the fish the fish were already pushed up onto the bank. Yep. They were already feeding hard. We were sight fishing, casting plastics at brim and watching other fish come out of nowhere. Sick. Get the plastic before the other ones. It was one of the, the most unbelievable sessions I've had. And the best thing we could have done was get off the boat. Yeah. It so would have been easy to so, we would have caught fish. We would have but it was shit. You you're trying to stand up. Yeah. It, yeah. it was terrible. Yeah. But yeah, yeah that, you, it's I think one that's of those a really a really cool a cool point. And I think that and again, going back to the bay, that you know, because as you said, like you got to be careful, um, and please don't take anything we say as advice on weather or anything. You just have to check where you are and what you're doing. But yeah, again, for for like a bit more open water and deeper water, like the bay or even beaches and stuff, you know, like there's land based options that where you're obviously a bit safer, like um, depending where you are, but. Snapper fishery land based on that morning to peninsula when it's a howling westerly. Yeah. Like that's just what you horrendous. Want. I wonder whether there's other options around and I'd love to open it up. Even and and look, if it's rivers and estuaries and lakes and stuff, tell us as well. But um because I wonder whether there's some big commercial boats and that, like pro boats and that that have done that do things like kingfish and stuff that have to fish basically every day for a living whether they find any changes when it's just rough as shit. No one else yeah. there. Recreational anglers are just going, waking up in the morning, going, nah, I'll play nah, golf today no. or something. Yeah. Um, or not even. Uh, <laughs> um, I wonder if those, some of those pro boats have just had blinders. Like they secretly hope it's rough because it's like all the recreational losers bugger off, leave it for us because we know it's going to go off. Like, do you know yeah. what? I, I don't know. Yeah. I'm curious it's, it's, to know that. that. That's a great question actually because... You know, charter boat operators as well. They'll fish in some pretty shit conditions. I, I'd say fun. they're, I'd say they're, in general, I think the charter boat operators are a hell of a lot more in tune with the weather these days, and they're not yep. pushing it because no. it's not comfortable. It, we're not trying no. to say the fishing could be amazing. I'm still not cut out for it. If it's blowing a thirty knot westerly, I am not going to sit on the Mornington Pier and try and catch a snapper, and no. which I've seen so many bullshit good fish caught off that pier in the time that I worked down there yeah. in the worst conditions. And every time I'd, I'd you sort of get to know these anglers and just look at them going, you're a lot better man than I am because I don't yeah. care how good the fishing is. I don't want to go and sit in it. So is that what it is? You, then are we putting down the fact that the fish are moving in shallow? So we'll, Snapper obviously do it in the bay. The flatties and brim that you were getting were right up on the banks is that what it is? They're just moving up shallower for whatever reason, whether it's there's more, whether that sort of weather's churning up more feed for them up on those shallow banks or they feel a bit more hidden, they can get right up there and feed on, you know, the stuff that's obviously affected by tide. So whether it's shellfish and crustaceans, what whatever. Um, or that weather, say, on the Mornington, uh, Mornington Pier is smashing against the pier, breaking off bits of oyster and shells and stuff and those snapper are having a ball. Whatever it is, 
Is that the case? Is that what it is that they're moving up there for that reason in those yes. conditions? And what what else is like? Can we find dewies and stuff like that up in the in, in the shallows in rivers? Well, I, th- I think the conditions create a perfect scenario because mm. even if you think of every predator the fish has got, they got to worry about cormorants and and sea eagles and birds overhead. Yeah. If the water's getting pushed and there's a lot of turbulence on top it makes it harder for those predators to pinpoint where the fish are. It's then also churning up the water so there's more feed, whether that be, like you said, debris smashed off the rocks, whether that be worms Mm. on a beach, whether it just be pushing weed in that's got shrimp and bits and pieces on it. The fish get a sense of the cover, which then triggers a feeding frenzy, and all of a sudden they're honed in on, on just feeding it. You can see how it presents a really good feeding environment because then you take the complete opposite. Sun's high, no cloud, glass out, clear water. Yep. Everything got, can see you. You've got every predator that knows exactly where you are at all times. And and mm. this happened on the first day for us. We were fishing in the canals at that point on the first day. Mm. And I there were so many brims sitting in four inches of water that we could see every single one of them as if we were swimming with them. Mm. And you couldn't put anything anywhere near them without them going 100 miles in every direction. They yeah. were so yeah. incredibly spooky. Yeah. Oh, you because, didn't take cast net? Because, no, nah, I left it at home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, you know what I mean? So they, they, Yeah, no, no, totally. And you're, you're right too about the seabirds. Like some of those seabirds, whether it's a cormorant or it's those eagles and that, that mate, they're it's glassed out, it glassed out and they, those clear estuary systems... You're not going up in the shallows if you're a fish. No. no. So on that day, we had to catch all of our fish into the tighter structure, whether it was the shadow of a boat hole, whether mm. it was a mooring, whether it was an old beat-up pier. If there was if there was shadow cover and there was structure, yep. the closer you put the lure to the structure, the more chance you were getting a fish. So again, the, yep. it, that and that makes perfect sense for the conditions that were that were at play on that on that given day, but it seems so much easier to catch fish when the weather is unbelievably shit. Yeah. Those days I look outside and go, not today. No. And I wonder no. if I wonder if that rule is true for other parts of all the, of those species. Other parts of the country and other species for sure. Let us know if you have any thoughts on it. I I mean, yeah, we get some great feedback as always, so I reckon there'll be some crackers. Maybe it's a freshwater thing. Yeah, trout to trout act differently. Yeah, odd. You know, in those wider rivers where they can get, when they can blow up a bit. Speaking of Mitch um, Chapman, w- w- I had a, a near death experience with him fishing <laughs> Lake Bolac in MV Shitter. Now, MV Shitter, <laughs> oh. for those playing along at home, was this little tinny that Christ, I think it's still kicking around. I saw it a couple of years back at Lake Ties, um, and it's caught it's, more fish than any MV Shitter tinny known to man. Oh, and, and I've had a similar experience for him out of Mornington. Yeah, we we were fishing Lake Bolac, like it, like, yeah. like a lake. I remember and the wind got up, and we nearly flip, this. nearly flipped the fucking thing. Like yeah. seriously, catching big, <laughs> big rainbow big trout rainbows, on Tazzies. Yeah. yeah, it was amazing fishing. And then oh, the wind got up. All of a sudden, there's like four foot waves. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <What the hell? laughs> and MV shitter doesn't slow down for anyone. No, any an, MV, an MV shitter just ate everything. It ate the waves. Oh. It ate the it ate the people that were in it. Yeah. It was, <laughs> it was so happy to grab a bit of water and throw yeah. it at you. <laughs> it was, yeah. It loved God. it. God bless MV shitter it'd, wherever it's now. It'd break the base of your spine every time you hit a tiny bit of yeah, a tiny bit of oh chop. yeah. I'm not convinced there weren't several, um, you know. Stress fractures in the hull of that boat, but she just kept going. No, it it didn't care. It uh, did not care. But um, yeah. So I don't know. I mean, the trout was still biting when the wind was up on that, and I've had some pretty windy days, sort of um, walking trout rivers as well. But I don't, I don't know. I'm probably not good enough of a trout angler to sort of know if there was a, if there's been a major difference in the way they've acted in that. That, those conditions typically that's when i'm getting wind knots going fuck this i'm going home i'm out yeah <laughs> so, so that's, that's more a me problem um anyway yeah that's a it's a great a great observation and i mean to have three days in a row where literally three different weather patterns is pretty cool too to, yeah. to see the difference 
But I think it's a great one. I think it's a really interesting point because as a whether you're a land-based angler or not, you it, you just roll over when you wake up in the morning and it, you can hear that wind howl and you go, not even getting not up. Not happening. But if the situation is safe, may, maybe it's an opportunity. Yep, maybe we're Lamb- leaving fish on the table. Rivers and lakes, land-based is a hidden gem. Like, And it's probably not hidden. There's probably plenty of people that do it. In fact, there are, but like... Blowing 30 knots, not well, the putting trout, the boat in. But, no, and the trout hey, rivers are probably perfect because they're so covered. Mm, you, you can they generally still get, get that, out of it. They still yeah, get that churn d- on the top. D- disturbs just, the top. Yep. That might change the way they act. Don't know. Um, maybe it's an opportunity to cast top water for trout. Oof. Oh, that's diving into a, an area, isn't it? It Jeez. is. What would you, if I said to you right now, we're standing on a river, you and I right now and our waders, You've only fallen over twice. You're going all right for the day. Yep. Ads, I want you to put on top water. I want you to catch a trout on top water lure. What are you tying on? I'm tying on either a small cicada walker. Okay. Yeah. Trying to keep it. Trying to keep it real natural. natural. Yep. yep. Or. Or a as lightly weighted as possible flick bait. That I can okay. s- that I can skip under the overgrown ledges. Yeah, 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 yeah. So and almost just just a hook. Yeah, yeah, unweighted. just a hook. Yep, just a hook, or yeah. you know, with you know, whether it's a one fortieth or a one sixtieth hidden okay. weight type thing. I yep. think that could be deadly on trout. It'd have mm. to be calm because you, you've got to you're not staying connected to an unweighted lure no. with any yeah. howling wind. But if I was to try and catch a trout on top water. Um, it would be either some sort of cicadery, crittery thing, just trying to mimic what they'd see anyway, or I'd be mm. going an unweighted flick bait. Yeah, I wouldn't mind trying a little bent. Ooh, nice. Or although <laughs> we did have a discussion around whether that is top water or not. <laughs> That's true. Well, you could make the same sort of <laughs> argument because for the when, flick bait, yeah. Well, when when yeah. we were fishing, when we were fishing the canals, that was the best way to catch these fish was was skipping unweighted. Flick baits. We were mucking around with uh, with some of the new Crush City stuff. So mm. we were just putting very lightly weighted flick baits into the shadows and up on on the side of boat holes, and it was yeah, awesome nice. because you see every hit. If you own a boat that you moor out in the water, you just you have to be willing to accept it's going to get cracked with jig heads like day. Like yeah. when I say cracked, not cracked open, but like smacked with jig heads yeah. all day every day. Yeah. yeah. So there, you're okay with that. You I'm 100 percent fine with it. Yeah, you have to because if, you've if created happy, a habitat. That's right. If you're not happy with it, put don't it on put a it in the water. Yeah, put it on the trailer because it's so it's so much fun. Yeah. Has anyone had Karen had a Karen moment where someone's told you off for <laughs> for casting under I've, a boat hole? Someone I've would wit- have. I've witnessed it a couple of times. At you have. Yeah. Yeah. Not right. full on. Not full on. But you can see they're clearly not happy that you're putting <laughs> lures anywhere near their boats. <laughs> and when you hit a boat with a jig head, it's a loud oh, noise. It echoes throughout <laughs> the whole thing. And and because generally, because generally, it's all, you're trying to get it into a specific spot. You can in the fucking cast in there. <laughs> But what's You're worse... You're punching it in so hard. I know, but then what's worse, you, you start getting nervous and instead of <laughs> and instead of putting lures where they need to go, you're overshooting them and you're getting them caught on the carpet in the boat and you've got no, you can't get in anyone's boat. You've got nah. to snap it off. Snap it so off. So these poor fuckers are getting in their boat the next time, potentially stepping on trebles because there's, <laughs> there's a small brim crank that's embedded in their carpet or the mooring ropes. The They're mooring the worst. ropes. Or and then just, as you, you know, on the on the yachts with those sort of um, almost like a, a those thin steel wire rails that go around yep. the whole because you bow. can guarantee that that lead is hitting it and it's winding up six or seven times. You're not getting it out, and you're not going anywhere near anyone else's boat because no. that would be the wrong thing to do. You've got oh. no better option but to ping the bastard off. Can you imagine yeah. how many boat owners in canals have found lures and jig heads? Oh, just be tackle boxes it, full. Embedded into their mooring ropes or oh. cut, like <laughs> anchor ropes. Oh, it's insane! It's insane. You don't want to be pulling that anchor up by hand. No, Jesus, no way. There'd be trebles all through it. 
Yeah, no that, way. That, feel, that feeling when you just misjudge one <laughs> and, and every it loops time. over. It, lo- it just loops over. Even, it can be really gentle, but as soon as it gets that first loop, you're right. There's at least six or seven yep, twists and, you just and it's carry, there for oh, good. Fuck. And you always <laughs> feel like the biggest wanker when it happens. Whether you can and you get into the side of someone's boat and it echoes oh. through the whole canal... <laughs> Or you end up busting lures off in people's on people's ropes or carpets. Yeah. You're just like, I want to. I really hope they didn't see it. I really when you're hope in a situation like the other day and you're with some people, do your first few casts you just go, I'm, I know I'm not putting it in the zone here, but I just need to just get my eye in a bit. So I'm dropping. I'm leaving it two or three meters short. I know every I am. single time. Yeah, it's <laughs> just I'm sure. Because the day Every you just walk time. up to that casting deck with confidence, just go, whoosh, and you know that is going to be overshot and you've gone. And you can't be doing that on the first cast. No, no and you Not can't. with other people on the no, boat. No, and you can't be doing it consistently because that's where I struggle. The second the confidence gets a little bit high, I'm like, I'm fucking on here. And then just skip one straight into a rope or put it up onto a mooring or yeah. and just go... Oh, I've just fucked this whole mooring for anyone else that yeah, wants to yeah. fish it because now I'm going to have to go in and either retrieve it or snap it off. You, and yeah. yeah, you don't want to be that guy. So the second you overshoot one or you get it wrong, the next five, six casts always land six <laughs> metres short, which makes you look like twice the cockhead as you are trying to put them on the right spot. Yeah. It's a, nah. it's a tough game on your emotions, fishing. It, it really is, is. Such an emotional, it's an emotional roller coaster. It really is. Oh man! If you've then, been and, there, and then you completely psych yourself out and forget to flick the fucking bail arm over, so you go to cannon one in, and the bail arm's not oh. done, and you just get this weird helicopter behind you. You nearly leave the hook embedded in your mate's back, or it hits his rod tip, and you're going, "This or, is just a or you hit, fucking disaster." Or you hit your own hull at a massive rate of knots <laughs> yeah. because you've just whipped it down, and yes. that noise scares the shit out of everyone on board, and they just look at you, and you just go, you've got yeah. to, I mean, you've got to own it. You can't hide from that. Yeah, or, yeah, or I you didn't do, open the bail arm, boys. Or you do overshoot oh. the odd one, and you crack it, and just rip the fuck out of it, and it comes out, and the lure comes <laughs> flying towards you, and yet, like you said, either cannons into the hull of the boat, or nearly hits your mate in the face, or you're ducking like a fucking moron because this lure's flying back at your head because you've cracked it on an overshoot and it's actually come out and come yeah. flying back at you and it's like that even in a tr- overhanging tree if you're on a trout river when you pull it because nine times out of ten it ain't going anywhere it's stuck but then yeah. you pull it once and you, and it comes flying out you did not expect it you can't see it either by the way the generally That's right. small it might be a spinner it might be something really small and you, I'd love to see because I've mate I've done it recently. I'd love to see footage of myself shitting myself and trying to duck and weave to get out of the way of something that I have no idea where it is. But then you act really cool, like yeah, that happened, and you just wind it back in and, and go oh. about your business. But yeah. or or the other one, you've got to bust it off. So you go yeah. the straight pull, point the rod, clamp the <laughs> spool, and come back, and it sounds like a fucking gunshot when it goes off. And yeah. for the split second, everyone in the vicinity is trying to work out if you snapped your line or snapped the rod in half, including yourself. And then it stretches the line out so much the braid all wraps up on itself, and you're like, oh, oh, "I'm gonna, have, I think it, I'm gonna have to retire this rod for today because yeah. I'm done with it." <laughs> I, often, I often think when I'm, you know. And, Openly admitting that I've done that, sit- I do that a lot. Wait, wait, when I'm grabbing that on. spool and pulling that that rod back towards yourself, are you doing damage to the spool? Because I feel like I am every single time. And everyone's face would be the same. Just please, just be the line that breaks. Please, just be the line <laughs> yeah. that breaks. And yeah. every now and then, there's a knot that surprises you. And when it's going to go, it, mm. it's gen- it is going to go at the leader knot. But every now mm. and then, the braid above the knot gives out before because and this is in a case where we're fishing like four pound braid six pound braid or really fine 10 pound braids yeah when they snap it sounds like someone's shooting at you like it's it it's not it's not a pleasant sound because everyone goes oh what was that i hope it was yeah. line i'm not sure you yeah. you're holding the rod going oh is there still a rod tip feel about it yeah. like it's no it's good. a crack it's a proper crack it's like a whip crack isn't it yeah Jesus. yeah it is it is. Or you no. bury one deep in a snag and bust it off. And the whole time you're thinking, just let there be leaders still on there. Just pop it off at the lure, please. Because retying leaders is a, 
fucking pain in the ass. Oh, well, that, that's something I was thinking about before when you were talking about the wind conditions. Once it's once it's blowing and you're tying six pound to four pound or whatever it is, like it's just you retire. You're just retiring that outfit. Yep, that's when just you go back to one. OG short one. leaders and back to back unis because you're yeah. not tying FGs and all that sort of funky no, not stuff that, that you shit. can do. Nah, nah. I, but, I mean, I've done. I've been guilty of that offshore where I've been dusted up on a reef or something, and you just go. There's fish here. Like, I'm not fucking about. Just do a, a dirty big back-to-back uni. And I know it looks ugly as fuck, but, but I've, given it, I've short kept no, it short, short the, enough that I could, don't even have to put it It doesn't through run the guides. through the guides, 100%. No. We've all been because, there. And there's, because there's nothing less appealing than the sound of a big knot getting cast through guides. Oh, oh. it makes me cringe. Because oh, as in, you, I just feel like that rod's being destroyed every time you cast. Yep. Or you load into a cast and it gets stuck on one of them and flips over and you're not oh. sure. You're like, that's a ridiculous idea for sure. And, and, then, then, and I've well, never had that happen when, to me. But. No, me either. But you just... Like rip a guide like off. Got, but the whole time yeah. you're just like, oh, that's ugly. Like there's nothing I, good about that. I always feel like the insert of a guide's just breaking every time I cast. Like you yeah. know, in that situation <laughs> or whenever I hear that. And... You know, there's a thing that braid does around the tip of a rod. Doesn't matter if it's heavy, light, whatever, and it makes no sense. Like how? Like I'm not even kidding. There should be studies done on how it is possible for for the braid to do. And you know what I'm talking about. I, and I can't. I, I think everyone has experienced it when it somehow does this little wrap around your rod tip. It doesn't sort of knot up or anything, but it's a wrap in a way that. You can't just flick it off and away it goes. You have to sit there with two hands and meticulously go through and unweave and unwrap. And and when you're doing it, you're going, but there's no way it could have done that. Like, how it, has it done that? It's such a shame that fishing line is essential for fishing. Because, because it's the worst thing about fishing. <laughs> it is. And not just on on every single fucking trip, yeah. you can guarantee... <laughs> The line, whether it's braid or mono, is going to do something stupid. Something fucked. That yeah. doesn't make sense. And doesn't. the other thing that grinds my gears that happened to me a fair bit, you cast a lure and it's the perfect cast. The perfect cast. Mm. And the fucking lure doesn't swim or it's fouled. And then you yeah. you wind it back in and the leader's done six wraps around two trebles and half trebles, the bib. Yeah. And you're like, it was perfect when I cast. How can one cast... Mm. Do that. Fishing line it, is the worst thing about fishing, and it's not yeah. even close. Yeah, <laughs> it's not close. It does stuff that shouldn't be able to be done. Like it recently happened. That little rod tip thing I was talking about happened, and I, I, I quickly just sort of grabbed it. If you can imagine, just like the rod tip, and I just grabbed it, the line off because it seemed to be just sitting over the top. And as I pulled it off, it legitimately tied a knot yeah. in my braid. And I'm like, but how, but how? How? It went on straight. How? It went through straight. Yeah. I, I get it a fair bit where the line wraps the stripper guide. Maybe not Maybe not so much these days since the introduction mm. of like anti-tangle guides, like K guides and stuff. But yeah. it happened to me twice on this last trip. And it's always in windy shit conditions. <laughs> but you've launched into a cast and the lure gets half a meter off the rod tip and just stops. And then you have a look at the stripper guide and there's it's somehow knotted 12 different ways. I want to see in slow motion yeah. how the fuck Super slow that man. happens. Because yeah, let's watch it. Yeah, it, it exactly. Come, you look at it and go, how is that possible? One piece of line turned itself into six with half a dozen <laughs> knots in it. Look, how? I, I, it's, it's not even... And it incites if, uh, instant rage. It's not even like a oh that sucks. I'll just end. it's I'm gonna snap every rod on this boat if this happens again. Braid has obviously changed the world from a fishing sense. Um, it really has, and it's for the better in ninety nine percent of its applications. But that one percent fucking oh. just ruins your day. Having said that. Is there space and room for a new technology? And I'm not... Uh, look, we're going to wrap up. I'm not suggesting we come up with it now, but what I'm saying is, why stop at Braid? Like, Braid came out of sort of nowhere, essentially, like, to, you know, to a degree, as far as it hit the market and unbelievable. I mean, there's got to be something that doesn't do that shit. Yeah, I'm getting they, angry yeah. just thinking about yeah. it. <laughs> I said it incites rage. 
It does. You're right. There has to be something. Has it to be. ends trips. We've spoken about this. It ends days yep. fishing. Yep. Fucking wind knots and weird <laughs> fucking tangles guide and tangles and shit. <laughs> and don't even... Like when they... Oh, I'm, oh I can't. Yeah. Well, that, the treble <laughs> thing is visceral, right? That yeah. treble thing on a lure is... Vi- it, it, can't, it cannot possibly do what it does to two sets of trebles and wrap around it 18 times and tie three knots. Yeah, it's, it, it ca- defies the laws that. of physics and I want to see it in super slow-mo uh, because, and I still, even then, I still don't think I'd get closure. I still wouldn't no. get it and I'd still rage about be it. angry. Yeah, you'd be angry about it. I've but raged quick fishing get it. so many times. Yep, I don't get it. Anyway... We got to we got to leave it there. I think we both need to go and have a bit of a, a sit down and just to get some, you know, have a think yeah. about our life. Um, you know, uh, we've yeah, got to move on wrong. from this. Anyway, you're not wrong. Get in touch. Get involved. The deep drop is where we're at. Um, had it did have a couple of questions throughout the week actually about the deep drop fishing tunes playlist ads on Spotify. Ooh, so you can do, jump do, in there. Due for an update, I might have to have a guess. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, nah, look, I'll, that's on me, and and that's on us. We, yep. we do need yeah, to do a bit of an update. Having said that, the tunes are still oh, fucking bangers, like you know. Yeah, that's right. And just don't leave worry. that leave that thing on shuffle. Sit back, enjoy. Oh. Maybe mosh a little bit in between casts. It's good for the soul. Do it. Bel- do whatever you belt want. Out, belt out a couple of tunes, groove out, catch some fish, enjoy it, and we will think about adding some new tunes to yeah, the and, fishing playlist. And if you want, if you've got suggestions. Oh, send them through. Send them through. Um, there's there's a few people that have saved the playlist ads, so that that's that's, that's cool. That's cool. I'm glad it's in there. All right, um, that's us. Uh, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Follow along on Instagram, and obviously get involved and give us some feedback. Send us a message if you want. Um, if you've got an epic story, send us an audio message. We'll play it on the show. Why not? Yeah, let's do it. Hey, it's not formatted radio anymore. Ads, remember? That's right. We can do whatever, do whatever we, we want. want. <laughs> And it, we will, and okay, we've got to go on an ad break in three, two, one. Wrap it up, wrap it up. Wrap it up. Wrap it okay. up. You're That's over. Us. You're now one point, you're now one minute 35 over. You've, you've now cost us two and a half thousand dollars, yeah. five thousand dollars. Wrap it up. Ten thousand dollars. <laughs> All right. I'll see you soon. Peace. See you, everyone. Bye.